welcome to Winnebago country in the state of Nebraska. As I sit here on this high point, gazing off at the old muddy water down here, which the Winnebago people have called Nishoch, meaning riled waters. Uh, I'm thinking about water. People everywhere seem to try to live next to water, or they always use the water for something more than just drinking and so forth. So uh, as I look at this uh, mighty Missouri, I think about the Winnebago tribe as they used it to come to this part of the country, being uh, natives of other states more easterly, they happened to be in South Dakota and in a concentration camp from which they escaped. And they used this mighty Missouri here to travel on. They came in boats, uh, dugouts, rafts, or anything that would float, I imagine, and came to this part of the country in the Omaha territory here. They, the Omaha people were glad to see the Winnebago's come because they had uh, quite a number uh, in their band as they collected themselves here in the Omaha country. And later on, this uh, the government found that the Winnebago's had migrated to this area, and so there were treaties made to re-establish the Winnebago people here in, in Nebraska. The Omahas were glad to have a friendly tribe move in, although they, today we hear about the poor Winnebagoes coming uh, begging, but many people who have been in concentration camps or wouldn't be in very good shape to go anywhere, and they would probably have to beg also. So that's not anything against the Winnebago people. So they were friendly, and uh, they negotiated the, the treaties. And so this is the homeland of the Winnebagoes today. And it was granted to them by a treaty made in 1865 which said that this land was theirs forever. We have reasons to doubt that some people do not know what the word forever means, and we lately have challenged the Justice Department of the United States to define what forever means, and we have not heard any echoes or words from the great white father's city. So, now to know about the Winnebago's, they have, uh, that treaty was negotiated and there was 120 sections on the north boundary, along the north boundary of the Omaha reservation. Later on, after 1865, the Wisconsin Winnebago's are those of the same nation that uh, did not remove themselves or were captured to move them to the prison camp in South Dakota. Uh, they had hid out in the woods of Wisconsin and later on being uh, rounded up and brought to Nebraska. So they needed 20 sections more and the, so that amount of land was purchased for the from the Omahas. So this was four miles, the way the treaty stated was a point on the Missouri River, four miles south of the north boundary of the reservation, the ceded area, and then 10 miles west, and then again two or four miles south, and we don't know how many miles west, but it was said a line to the end of this ceded area, and then north 
to the north boundary and the north boundary along the north boundary east to the river. And along the river back to the point of beginning. So this was encompassed quite an area. And so as I sit here and look out over the river, I can see the high water mark line, uh, which is lined with cottonwood trees over yonder is uh, that area is still Winnebago land, although it's been uh, encroached upon and uh, taken as accretion land to those people on the other side of the river. So there is much land out here that is uh, still uh, in litigation, same way with the Omaha people. So we, this river here is a, quite a river. It one time moved many miles over there, and one time it was up almost against these high banks that we are talking from. Well, we talked about the river here, but uh, I guess there might be some question as to who the Winnebago's were or where they come from, uh, the early history. So the earliest documented uh, record uh, of history of the Winnebago's was uh, is supposed to have been the meeting or the discovery of the Winnebago's by one uh, Jean Nicolet, a French man, a commissioner of some sorts, uh, and an ambassador uh, appointed by governor of Canada or the New France, I guess it was called back there in 18, no, 1634. Uh, Champlain, I guess, was the one ordered Nicolet to come out and uh, find these people or find any people and make treaties with them to, so that France might have a good fur trade business going to set up. So they were located around Green Bay. Uh, some of the people or the Klansmen say that this was where the Winnebago's originated. They rose up out of the waters of Green Bay and uh, became uh, people that could live on land. I don't know where they, else they would come uh, unless they escaped from the escape hatch of some interplanetary spacecraft that might have landed in Green Bay and then they escaped. But anyhow, that's kind of fiction. And so from Green Bay, uh, the Winnebago country ex extended down to about uh, where Chicago, the Rock River comes into the Mississippi at Rock Island. And then the land uh, going north goes up to Chippewa Falls and then straight across the north there to Green Bay. It was quite an area. And by uh, the 1800s, why they needed more land for settlers to live on, so uh, they began to move the Indians out in uh, 1830 or 29, I guess, they began to cede part of their land by treaties and 1832, they ceded some more, and 1837, they disposed of their aboriginal homeland in that area. And they became, began to wander, move around uh, from state to state. So they came into the neutral ground in northeast Iowa. In 1847, they ceded that, and they were relocated at St. Cloud, Minnesota. In 1855, again, there was another treaty uh, made because the land up there was so sandy that they couldn't raise corn. So then they moved down to Blue Earth region, which was probably the heart of Eden at that time because that, that's a really nice soil. And then comes 1862 when the Sioux 
the Santee Sioux had a waiting for a government uh, to carry out its promises and so forth, starving people, and they couldn't take it anymore, and so they said they were going to drive the intruders out and caused a big uprising up there in Minnesota, and it's known as the Great Sioux Uprising of 1862. Well, the Winnebago's were asked to join in this uprising, which they did not because they had already established farms that were agricultural people, and they were farming, and had uh, some of them were even uh, taking out uh, allotments in severalty uh, voluntarily and becoming citizens of the United States. Well, due to the uprising, the citizens of Minnesota didn't want any Indians left in that state, and they asked the government to move them out. So the Winnebago's uh, don't hold Abraham Lincoln very in very high esteem for him signing the removal of that tribe. They said he might have freed the black ones, but he had taken the Winnebago's and put them in concentration camp. And so it, it was that many of the Winnebago's were, uh, the population was reduced quite sharply there. Uh, my days, I used to hear the old timers tell about how many people there were. That's 22,000, over 22,000 because of the uh, fact that the way they count in Winnebago, it, it's quite a, quite a number of people that made up the tribe at the time. Some of them were shipped down the Mississippi River on flat boats, which were upset, and many drowned there. The oldsters, which were taken across overland, died on the way, some were feeble, they fell down, they couldn't get up, and uh, so forth. I don't like to talk about uh, the atrocities that was done to them at that time, because we're not going to go to war, we're trying to talk about things here for history's sake. Well, anyhow, they got to Fort Thompson, which is about 22 miles north of Chamberlain, South Dakota. And there in a cedar compound with the fort, the Fort Thompson, they put the Winnebago's in concentration camp. And again, there was other kind of atrocities <clears throat> brought upon them, so they the head men said, no, we, we're going to stay here. We're not going to get out of here alive. So we better move out. It's better to die trying to get away and fighting for freedom. Uh, but this way, we're, we're going to run away from this place to be free. So this is where the boats, rafts, logs, what, whatever, even some of the Sioux brothers, uh, reading the smoke signals I would further up the river might uh, throw logs and so forth in the water so that material could be come to the Winnebago's by water for their need, needs and uh, build some kind of raft to escape. And they escaped from this place in little groups. They didn't all leave at once. Because some of them that were left, uh, the last bunch that came down the river, they also reported, we were the last, and they said, get out of here, we don't want you anymore, and so they turned us loose. So as they come down the river, they were, uh, I guess, pioneers, you'd call them, I don't know. But anyhow, they would see the Indians out in the middle of the river, and they'd, they'd shoot at them. Uh, many of them were killed, many of the boats were hit and maybe sunk, the people drowned. 
And so by the time they got here, as I was pointing out those high banks over there, they had uh, the Iowa farmers were working their fields over there, and so they said, we're not going to go ride down the middle of the river. Let's get up against the bank there and uh, ride right underneath them. So, so this is what happened, and this is the way they told. It was told to me that they went in a southeasterly direction and went around the curve, and then they came north a little bit and swung sharply around against the high banks on Nebraska side and went down south again. And there the, was the gathering of the Winnebago's, and it happened to be around Decatur, Nebraska, where the town site of Decatur, Nebraska, that's, that's where the Winnebago's collected. Some say that the reason they stopped there was uh, one of the elderly ones uh, took sick and they had to stop for burial purposes there. But uh, where they were headed was down to St. Louis to get to the Mississippi, which they were going to go upstream and go back to Wisconsin. Now, without maps and so forth, they were traveling this way. They knew where they were going. Uh, they were quite adept at traveling around the country, so they didn't need maps, I guess. They, it was just their home. But that was their purpose of coming down the Missouri River. They were trying to get back to the Mississippi and, and finally get back to their homeland in Wisconsin. But this is where they were when uh, the Omahas befriended them and due to some sickness or uh, wars uh, by the Sioux coming down and raiding the Omahas, uh, they, they were somewhat decimated there. And there weren't too many Omahas at the time, so they welcomed the Winnebago's. And once again, we, the tribe became a buffer between the Sioux and other tribes who were suffering at the raids of the Sioux. So ever since then, the Winnebago's have been here. The lifestyle of the Winnebago's in Wisconsin, uh, as much as I've heard of it, and some of it has been recorded, was that there were hunters, fishermen, agriculturalists, uh, they were kind of jack of all trades. So they had these settlements along the Rock River, the Fox River, so forth, uh, which one comes south and, and uh, ends up in the Mississippi, the other one ends up in uh, Lake Winnebago uh, and runs kind of crossways from Lake Winnebago to uh, Portage, Wisconsin, and Portage got its name from where they traveled up the river and then they carried their canoes over into the Wisconsin River and, and traveled up and down those rivers. They traveled quite considerable distances in the fall to hunt uh, big game, like up in the north area where the bear and the deer were plentiful, they would use these rivers and, and travel to those hunting grounds. But in the summer times, they sort of, well, planted gardens. They had to be farmers and take care of their crops. I guess maybe, maybe the squaws, as they called them, had the had all the work to do. But I, I think any any people who are closely knit like the Winnebago's were, I think the men just had just as much work in the garden as the women did. So not being there, why I, <coughs> I don't like to talk too much about what each sex did there as far as the lifestyle. But anyhow, we know that they put their 
winter food, uh, got it ready in the summer, drying berries and uh, picking roots of some kind of edible roots, which today uh, I'd like to have some of that, but it's against the law to even pick the bulbs of the uh, water lilies and, and so forth. I guess that is pretty good stuff to eat. Well, anyhow, their lifestyle was, their way of life and so forth was so uh, much a part of them that regardless of where they went, they would still live the same way. So when they came to Nebraska, they, they had the same thing. These rivers that, well, this river is the only big water we got this near here, so it was uh, used for travel up and down the river, and uh, also there's plenty of fish there. In the winter time, there's a lot of trapping going on. Uh, these rivers were traveled on with these dugout boats. They were hollowed out of logs. Uh, either they had tools to do it, or they burnt out the logs and scraped the charcoal out to very carefully so that uh, it would be a, what do you call it? A good sound boat. So they, they raised corn, squash, potatoes, etc. And then we had also in this country, we have uh, what they call Indian potatoes, and we have uh, other kinds of edible roots. I think a real Indian uh, right in this part of the country would say, well, being someplace else, uh, would say, let's go back to God's country because there's a lot of things here, and a real Indian could survive here, even uh, if droughts killed off all the food plants. Uh, maybe very few of them would survive today. I mean, they have to be good Indians to really get through the winter. So that river was very important to to the people. And when they first come here, they uh, hired out to the farmers over in Iowa and. Uh, I remember them talking about my grandfather. He was one of the guys that uh, always was over there every week. Maybe every weekend he'd go over there because they were having, oh, I guess these little town fairs and so forth. And he, he used to like to r run, and he was a, he'd be over there challenging all the farmers over there in foot race and so forth. So he, he was quite a guy to go over there. Now this. This country was infested with rattlesnakes, and in order to get rid of them, they imported bull snakes from Iowa to combat the rattlesnake population over here. So we, we don't hardly ever find a rattlesnake over here. I think they're all been squeezed out by the bull snakes. So there isn't too much difference between the lifestyle of the Wisconsin people and the Nebraska Winnebago's. Uh, they, when they have gardens, they take care of their gardens, they dry their corn and, and store their corn for winter. Now, they, this, this is quite a thing today that the people get uh, corn. One time it is uh, plentiful. And the people knew how to prepare it so much. Today, uh, the price of that corn is running up to eight to ten dollars a quart. So, I mean, that's uh, it's going to be high-priced food pretty soon. So I think that about, about takes care of uh, their their vittles. I'll talk a little bit about the modern history of the Winnebago's with this river. 
Now, this river is a mean river. It, it, one time it could go be here, and uh, next year it'd be over the, yonder. And so I guess they call that meandering of the river, and they, he used to really meander until the Corps of Engineers, through a national river stabilization program, uh, somewhat contained this river in its present channel. But during this process, uh, they had to survey across this bottom here and put a new channel in there. And uh, usually, uh, they, they would fight a, and we'd call that encroaching and uh, coming on uh, the reservation uh, to, to build some government things and which we would not tolerate in the past because this land was given to us by the treaty and forever and this, this was our land and we had to say so about it and it did not really rest with a tribal council or any headman to say this is my land it is ours so we speak in a way that the land belongs to us but uh, this was a national program, so the tribal council said we will we'll go along with the national council, or the uh, what the Corps of Engineers set up to control the flooding by this river. They were begin to build dams up north there and on Indian land and so forth. But right here, they couldn't build a dam here. They'd have to build one from here to maybe way back on the other side of uh, those high hills, and that would cost the government too much to build a dam. And where it's Indian land, I'm sure they wouldn't uh, hold back a dime if they thought they'd build one here. But uh, not thinking about that, we thought that this is a national program, so we'll go along with it. We are citizens of the country by the act of 1924. So we want to do what's good for the citizens of this portion of the country and control the river. And uh, it so happened that part of the land was cut off, it was severed. We di didn't get any severance pay for it. And uh, since the title of this land was held by the government, it seemed to be that well, we can do that anyhow, because we got title to it. They're forgetting about that word forever again, and so I just keep reminding people about that forever word. Uh, I don't know, maybe the United States government might be a pretty good lover and make all kinds of promises, like I've heard some guys uh, talking, I'll give you the moon, and so forth to his girlfriend, but uh, I don't know, Uncle Sam, he, he's a bad lover. He says he's gonna do this for you and I'll give you this forever and then he takes it back. Anyhow, so this begins our modern problems down here. We're having troubles now. That land has been condemned, uh, that was cut off from the reservation proper, had been condemned by the Army Corps of Engineers, and we say that they can't do it. And so we've gone to court about it. And I'm sure, as I'm sitting right here, you see me that we will eventually uh, beat the Corps of Engineers. he become a little bit of monster-like, you know. He, all on a milk of human kindness, he became a big monster, he's destroyed uh, millions and millions of fish in Florida, and and now he's uh, causing uh, some other things to happen. He's got to help him build an inland port in Oklahoma, and I don't know what. He does anything he wants to. Corps of Engineers, he said, uh, Uncle Sam, Congress gives me the money to do these jobs, therefore, I have the authority to condemn and build and so forth. 
but there are other treaty rights that should stop him. And so this is what's happening over here in the state of Iowa. Well, I, did, I don't want to fight with Iowa, but it's, it's their talking. They said, you can't own both sides of the river. It's like I explained to you, your property, I had to put a road through there why, unless I buy it and then it's, then you wouldn't own it. But if I cut your property in two, you own both sides. I just take the middle. So that's what happened down here and uh, somewhere down the line, uh, somebody goofed, the tribal council granted to give the state of Iowa the East Bank. Just that bank. But now Iowa has called the land to this east bank, the accretion land to Iowa. So there are problems now that we're still in litigation. We're waiting for the Omaha tribe to finish up with their court procedures. Uh, we have the same witness, uh, expert witnesses, and so we said, well, you go ahead. Take care of the other guy first. We'll wait, because we got a, a word forever in our treaties. But we can, we can wait that long. So are there any questions in your mind to answer something else? was I'm trying to talk peace today. Everybody wants peace, but are you willing to work for it? That's a good feeling to have peace. You know. Well, welcome again to Winnebago land. Uh, this portion here is known as Big Bear Hollow. Uh, it was a settling place of Chief Big Bear, uh, right down the valley here, which you'll probably see later on. And this hollow goes on up to that hill. That's the South Big Bear Creek, it used to call it, and this one going this way is the North Big Bear Creek, and uh, there's not much of a creek there anymore. It's the waters that were Coming down these hollows are fed by springs, and it seems like oh, over the years the springs have uh, plugged up, or nature had changed its plans in this part of the country. So when the Winnebago's first came to this part of the country, and this become their land forever, the chief, Big Bear settled here. And those people that uh, were sort of close to him, clan-wise and uh, friends and so forth, uh, settled in this area. And this place is, seems deserted today, but many years ago and before my time, uh, this had many wigwams, bark lodges, tents, log cabins, a halfway things. Uh, they used to dig in the ground and then to finish off the top part with logs and uh, roofed it. They even had dirt put on for the roof. I don't remember them building sod houses, but uh, then we had villages all up this hollow and over this other side. In this area, is known as Big Bear Hollow because of Chief Big Bear living right at the entrance to this hollow from the river. So people lived here and I guess they were very happy. They had clearings here, they made gardens and so forth. And at the bottom of this ravine, uh, there used to be plenty of this Indian potatoes. So in the spring of the year, when they start plowing the gardens or the fields here, the people would 
sort of follow behind the plow and pick the Indian potatoes. They would harvest them in the spring before they uh, sprouted to form other potatoes. And that was the end of that potato, and the Indian got a hold of it, so. Uh, we had, my boyhood was spent up in that South Big Bear Hollow. Uh, sometimes uh, it just depends on how I feel. I come down here in these late years and uh, I don't hear those voices anymore. Kind of makes a lump here and you got a little pain here. And so we have to open that little bottle up and uh, take a little white pill, you know, kind of taper off. Because I remember we could hear children playing here and there. You could hear their voices echoing all the way up these hollows. So my friend, Big Bear, the youngest Big Bear, lived down here. And I lived up there. And we'd sort of shout signals back and forth, you know. And the echo. You could hear it all over these valleys, and they'd say, well, those two are planning something, because they'd hear the shout in answer to the other. So we were close friends, and uh, being that he's a Bear Clan member, and I'm a Wolf Clan member, and the two clans were friend clans from the beginning of time. One uh, was like a brother to the other, in fact, at times, they uh, would say that your clan brother was closer to you than your own blood brother. So this is what we enjoyed, this kind of a relationship. And uh, in the early times, they used to send out uh, an educational man from the agency to round up the people who have children of school age. Well, the big bears uh, didn't really want their grandson to go, go to school, so they'd either hide him in a cellar or give him a little package of lunch or something and said, get down to the river or get out in the woods. Well, I'm up there. Well, I like to be in the woods anyhow. Anybody's coming towards the house, I always was in a managed to be in the woods, so I that was my area, and Big Bear was down here along the river, so. Uh, but I must have got captured, so I got sent off to school. But Big Bear seemed to do pretty good by staying out in the woods, and by these two kind of types of things going on, this is where we either got a little education or we didn't get enough. And I find that if you get so much education where there's so much more to know, you find out that there's a lot of things more that you should know and you don't know anything to compare uh, with that which you should know and you just keep it going. You can keep going to school all your life. But Mr. Big Bear, he managed to uh, self teach himself somehow uh, and later on, later on he, he's in California now. But soon he'll come home. He'll retire and come back. But there's always a desire that maybe someday again there might be a village, the village down here through Big Bear Hollow so that the, the oldsters can listen to what they used to hear many years ago. And it's, it's, that's kind of a dream, I guess, and it's going to come to pass if the Winnebago's continue as a tribe, because more and more people are coming back to the reservation, demanding more land to live on. And so maybe it might be so that it'll happen. Now, at that time, uh, the village was here, we had just I say we, I might have been along there somewhere with them. And 
uh, settle this area uh, haphazard, you know, just any place you want such, a, such your dwelling, because it was tribal land at that time, and in 1887 comes the Dawes Act, uh, where the land was being surveyed, divided up, and uh, so on. So, John Big Horse, he gonna live over here. That's your place. Big Bear, you stay here. Uh, you people up there, the priests. You, you move over there because you, this is somebody else's land. You move over there. And so this broke up this uh, community. And the, everybody had to move on their allotments. Well, in the, in the overall picture, to me, uh, I see that the Allotment Act was a method by which the Indian supposedly was going to get on his own and they're going to overnight teach him how to farm and make a white man out of him. Either that or because Indian doesn't farm big and so forth, that he was going to be separated from his property in the near future. And that this was kind of the setting in which well, most of the land now has been sold, and we don't have too many acres left. And those allotments are kind of checkerboarded now on the reservation. Uh, would be little black spots on a white sheet of paper, just uh, Indian land ownership. So the Allotment Act also I think was a violation of the treaty, whereas the treaty said this is your land forever. So they said King's X, and they took the land back and they, they cut it all up in pieces and they began to tell them what, where to live and so forth. I think that was one of the first violations of our treaty and I never got a chance to explore it a little further to see what can be done about that. I claim that that was a wrong thing to do because the other tribes in the Southwest, they have their land in, in common and they still have their entire reservations where you divide it up. It's like the old Roman tactics, divide and conquer. So now we have the bottom land down here is tribal. This is an allotment to somebody. I think the decorus have this piece. The next piece to this next 40 east of us here is uh, an alienated piece of land. And then comes the Big Bear allotment. So the land you see around here in the woods are Indian allotments allotted the lands and uh, they're non-taxable they're because of a certain type of allotting there were two types one was the Fletcher allotments which today are tax are taxable and the Leeming allotments are tax exempt yet today uh, and when a piece of land becomes alienated, the, the tax business gets right on it. But there's some land here that are uh, owned by non-Indians, and they have never collected taxes on it. And the reason for that, says the county assessor, is they don't raise crops on it. But the law says that when an Indian title is removed, it becomes taxable. So the county doesn't want to tax it, well, I can't help it. At the same time, I don't want the county to say, well, there's so many, so much Indian property tax exempt that we have to propose to the government to get monies here in lieu of taxes, which we do not collect on the Indian land. So 
that kind of problem uh, develops here and is not looked into by other people and so forth. All they, all they hear is Indians don't pay taxes and that is kind of a uh, snide way of making a person think or a non-Indian think other than people other than Indians think that the Indian is not quite a, an equal citizen because you don't pay taxes. So I, I assure you that, that they are citizens and they pay their share of taxes. Getting back to this settlement thing, I, this was, as I said, Big Bear because the chief Big Bear lived in this area and his friends sort of collected around. But uh, there was quite a, quite a number of people coming down. In 1881, they counted 1,244 Winnebago souls. And so they located all over here. Now, the most of them lived in the wooded area of the reservation. That is, uh, I guess it might be about eight miles the eastern part of the reservation was uh, wooded and uh, probably because they were woodland people in Wisconsin and lived and thrived in, in wooded areas, they chose to live here in little settlements. So Big Bear and his group settled this hollow or throughout here and uh, well it clans were intermixed it wasn't just certain clans had to s stay by themselves now, over to the north here was a honey creek area and they called that the honey creek they named the creek i guess the more more bees was found up there bee trees and whatnot so they called it the honey creek area now, further south of Big Bear Hollow, there are people that lived in that area. They seemed to always lock themselves in when somebody came or, or was approaching their places, even if it was to place a stick across the doorway of their wigwams. And that was a sign that that edifice was locked just by placing a a stick across the doorway. That means that they, they got the house locked up. Now, I don't know why they went and beg or somewhat. They were kind of uh, humorous people too, but uh, in their own way. So south of here in the, where we had been this morning, there was a settlement down there and all of them seemed to be very heavy had plenty to eat or maybe they had good fish down there and so forth and they were all obese and everyone was like that in that village so the rest of the people got together and they got to name that town so they called it the big belly town Nihakate Chinagara the big belly town and up on a ridge further south there, they had the uh, sacred dance ground, they called it. A sacred dance ground. Uh, that needs a little explaining. Uh, this took place uh, when somebody passed away. I guess it was a ritual just like we have wakes. Today we have wakes uh, similar to other people that at somebody's passing they have a wake. Uh, these guys, what they did was uh, perform a drum ceremony. Well, there was a lot of singing and drumming and so forth going on. That was to cheer up the person who lost a loved one and then at the same time uh, it's my understanding that the, the departed he hates to go on when he looks back to see his 
his family, his loved ones there, that he's leaving and they're weeping and, and being sad and so forth. So this drum ceremony also uh, is carried on and these people, the bereaved people, will dance. And the, the belief was that the departed will look back and, and uh, see his children uh, rejoicing that he had finished his journey this far and the transition point was where he was traveling on. And someday when they finish their journey on, on this earth, why they're, they're going to take this road and the, the ones that are left are going to rejoice because he had finished his race. Oh, I, I don't think that it would be anyone will argue about this fact. Now, these things that I'm talking about, right now I might make the statement that there are my, just what I feel, what I have been told, and I, I understand it, and I'm not here to tell you something about the Winnebago's that is not true, and if there's anybody that knows more about it, they, welcome their input to enhance this program of introducing Winnebago's to other people and even to modern day Winnebago's who do not know their background. And this is the only purpose that uh, why I might be doing what I'm doing now is sitting here visiting. <laughs>